Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded, willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might just become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner Ravinder awaits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We do have a great chat room, so Ravinder, tell us all about it now, will you? Yes, we have a lovely chat room, a great group of people. It's very educational, very entertaining, Um, just lots of fun in there too, except the fact that you are not there. So if you are somewhere where you can safely go on the internet, do please come join us. That's provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. All right, this week I wish to further our conversation regarding the arrival of the Orwellian age. My recent privacy blog received this comment from Shelley, quote, Gwen Towers, Harp, Apple, not the phone, the scent of fear, marketing, subliminal messaging and media, fluoride in the water, and nobody seems too concerned about anything that our government is doing. Our children are being force-fed stimulant drugs, and I don't think it is a coincidence that during Project MK Ultra, we discovered that stimulants made people more susceptible to suggestion. What the hell is going on, and why is it only very few people seem to be concerned? Close quote. These are matters, among many others, that I discuss in depth in my new book, Gotcha, The Subordination of Free Will. I dedicated nearly five years to seeing this book published as I believe that if people really knew what's going on, they'd do something about it. Is that a fair assumption? What do you think? This week I reviewed some of the data I have been collecting that provided further proof of the direction we are headed in, and I had to pause when I turned over an article on RFIDs. In case you don't recognize the term, RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification a technology that uses electronic tags placed on objects, people, or animals to relay identifying information to a central data center. Okay, many of us have implanted RFID chips in our animal friends. All three of our dogs have chips just in case they get lost. So this technology seems friendly enough. Should it be of any real concern? As I discuss in Gotcha, the Affordable Care Act calls for medical ID implants, on the basis that this would prevent medical errors. Your personal RFID would access your complete medical record and therefore any allergies or other medical concerns such as difficult intubation would immediately be available. This could save lives and certainly seems like a judicious way to prevent unnecessary mistakes that may lead to the loss of life. Oh, but that surgeon's scalpel metaphor returns. When there is a threat, we seem to quickly accept invasive technologies and other means used in the name of safety. This past Tuesday, we saw the city of Brussels, the capital of Europe and home of NATO, come under absolute martial law. A total lockdown of the city. Imagine that in the USA. A stay-in-your-home order. National security is absolutely important, and we Americans have already accepted the loss of some of our freedoms in the name of security. As such, it's not at all far-fetched to conceive of the idea that there may be another catastrophic failure of some kind that leads to fear and panic and consequently additional levels of protection. In this kind of situation, if our pattern holds, we will accept whatever is deemed appropriate by those in power to keep us safe. Okay, what has that got to do with RFIDs? Well, what if we were to have a major banking collapse? What if this created the sort of financial crisis that put our savings, our paychecks, our credit cards, and so forth, all at risk? Think of some computer invasion that raids accounts at random 
where the system has sufficiently collapsed and is therefore unable to fend against such a cyber attack. And there are many other such possible scenarios. Well, well I, why not use this RFID technology to do more than protect us from medical mistakes? Why not use it for our entire ID needs? Driver's license, permits, banking, etc. Now our RFID implant, perhaps in our right hand, pays for our purchases, obtains cash for our needs, and so on. This certainly seems more convenient than carrying all those cards. With one microchip, our complete identity is available, so whether it's checking out library books or picking up a prescription, clearing airport security or anything else, one hand scan does it all. Now you should know that RFID chips can be easily tracked, and many of them already incorporate GPS technology. Theoretically, the technology also exists to use the chip as a receiver for small jolts of electricity and more, perhaps to remind you to take your medicine. I hope, as you begin to think this through, that you are also beginning to question the value of your own personal RFID. Now add this. There are many, especially among certain Christians, who believe that one day RFIDs will be necessary to access money in any form. So in short, if they're right, we might all have these implants. They see this as the mark of the beast. Quoting for a minute from the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelations, quote, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Close quote. What are your thoughts on this, Ravinder? You know, I'm not a biblical scholar of any kind, so I cannot comment on, on that aspect of it. But when you talk about these chips, you know, I find the whole thing really scary because I can see exactly why we would walk into that. We do have our pets tagged just in case something happens to them. And I remember when our boys were young, you know, and then you heard about different kidnappings and children being taken and... It certainly occurred to me, wouldn't it be a lot safer just to get them tagged? Then wherever they are, you can find them. Um, talking, but that is such a slippery slope. When you uh, talk about children, you are aware that they have, in certain schools, already developed shirts that have RFIDs that are personal. And when you come in, you know, you wear this shirt when you go to school or, or when you leave and as you come in, it, it automatically logs you in, what time you arrived, da-da-da-da-da, <laughs> make sure you're in the class. Hard for kids to play truant in that way, that's for sure. No, I wasn't aware of that. Um, and once again, though, I can see advantages to it, but it's just, it gets so scary so quickly. I don't know. Isn't that the, the perfect uh, way to control the masses is through fear? Well, it absolutely is. Okay, every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week our show featured Professor Loretta Bruning, and we discussed habits of a happy brain. Jonathan wrote, great show. Her theory makes a lot of sense. Ed wrote, my question is about serotonin. We get a bit of serotonin when we can best someone or one-up them. What is the scope of the one-up feeling? Do we need to be physically proximate to them, or can we do it online or over the phone? Do they need to be someone we know? Do they need to be human? Or if I'm playing against a machine and beat the computer, does that also release serotonin? Well, you know, in answer to that, Ed, I personally think there's just a lot of other ways that we can get our serotonin, and they're many better ways than the idea of one-upmanship. My view, anyway. Mark commented, So the standard of happiness for the guest is anything that makes us feel good. She's actually defining a happy brain, Mark, not happiness per se. As was pointed out, you might make your brain momentarily happy by satisfying a drug addiction, but that certainly doesn't make for a happy life. Moving on, Mike wrote, I had an elderly lady purchase your inner talk for every young package. She was speaking of dying. She had given up. 
After using for just two days, she was filled with life once again. She is looking forward and not back. I am amazed, as is her daughter who purchased a program for her on my recommendation. Well, thanks for making the recommendation, Mike, and for sharing the story. Valerie wrote, I, Dr. Taylor, I have been using your wonderful products for many years with great success. And Jennifer wrote, Hi, Mrs. Ravinder. I love yours and Dr. Eldon's email newsletters and radio show. Now, you like getting those letters, isn't that right? I do, I do. I work hard on my newsletters. Well, tell us about them. Tell everybody about them. How do they get them? You can subscribe, you know, um, anywhere on our website. So at ProvocativeEnlightenment.com, you can simply subscribe there. You can go to EldonTaylor.com and subscribe there. We send a newsletter out generally once a week. Uh, We try to include articles of interest. Um, I'm always relating stories about stuff that we've done and what that's taught us and thereby hopefully what we can teach everyone else out there as well. So I have fun with it. We get some great feedback from it, which is always good. So yeah, do come subscribe and join our family. All right. That's all the time we're going to take for letters today. But I do invite you to opine by sending your comments to Eldon. That's E-L-D-O-N at EldonTaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. And I want to thank all of you for your letters and comments. We truly do appreciate your feedback and support. Now to this week's show, The Coming Financial Crisis, A Crisis by Design, with author John Truman Wolf. So let me tell you a little about today's guest. John Truman Wolf is the creator and author of the award-winning Tom McKenna Private Eye series. In the nonfiction genre, his book Exposing the Real Forces Behind Global Financial Crisis became an Amazon bestseller. His latest re- release, The Coming Financial Crisis, A Look Behind the Wizard's Curtain, which is a read you have to get. I, I tell you, my copy is probably one-third highlighted at this moment. Uh, and we'll be discussing it today. It includes the expose of the source behind the global financial crisis as well as their current agenda, now in full swing to implement bail-in procedures. Now, pay attention to this. Bail-in procedures by big banks that enable failing banks to confiscate funds in their depositors' accounts and convert them to bank stock. I hope you got that. John Truman Wolf is also the editor and publisher of The Hard Truth, an online investigative magazine that exposes government and corporate corruption and abuse. He has been a senior credit officer for two California banks, one in San Francisco Bay area, the other in Beverly Hills. He is the co-founder of prestigious Los Angeles-based business management company, where he oversaw the business and financial affairs of some of the biggest names in Hollywood. John has spoken to bankers and business executives around the world on the oppressive agenda of what he calls the global financial mafia and has provided solutions to their programs. Having read of his solutions, Chinese government officials flew him to Beijing to consult with them on the causes and solutions to the global financial crisis. He spent several days in Beijing discussing the information revealed in his book with these parties, as well as doing media interviews for national Chinese television. Now, in reality, John Truman Wolf is the pen name of Bruce Wiseman. But since you'll find his book under his pen name, we will use his pen name today. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Mr. John Truman Wolf. Uh, Eldon, hi. Thanks so much for having me. No, it's indeed my pleasure, and I was serious. I have at least highlighted a third of this book. It's a great read, too, and I love how you write it because, you know, I found myself laughing at some some of the what I should be crying about just because of how you've written it. You are a great author. That that's without saying, that stands out in your fiction books. But it it carries over into this book, despite the fact that this is a frightening story. Let me ask you this: You heard today's spotlight. So, uh, are we headed toward microchipping for banking? Well, I I don't know about microchipping, but something very similar. And then along those lines, uh, there is very definitely, uh, Eldon, a war on cash, meaning uh, a movement to remove cash from society and replace it with zeros and ones. Uh, With zeros and ones in your bank account um, and not, 
the you know greenbacks or whatever, uh, you can be tracked. Your purchases can be tracked. Uh, banks can confiscate the money. Any you know wherever your digital account goes uh, can be followed with great ease. So uh, it's very parallel to the story you told at the top of the hour. Okay, now you know I'm maybe getting ahead of myself, and I'm going to ask you a couple of what might seem to be off the reservation questions, but we've we've discussed some of these things in the past, and you know the first thing that comes to my mind when I'm reading your book is there has to be some folks out there like yourself who are willing to blow a whistle, and and when I think about that, I think about you know the suspicious death of so many bankers over the past three, four years now. Um, have you got any input on that? I mean, last count, there were more than 48 bankers who died in suspicious ways. Well, it's a hot question, um, and I have had a number of uh, readers of, of my online magazine approach me with it, and an honest answer to the question is I haven't had enough time to investigate it in depth, there is a, as you know, a stunning, I don't know if coincidence is the right word, but, a, you know, a stunning uh, series of statistics of bankers either dying or committing suicide uh, over the last, uh, you know, as you know, the last year, the last 18 months. Um, what may be behind it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. There is a growing use. You mentioned uh, briefly in your uh, opening talk about the, the massive drugging of, of, of Americans, and of right. course, uh, many of these mind-altering drugs are tied to suicide. And and uh, uh, so, uh, but I the, the honest answer is I really haven't been able to take enough of these and look into them to go, you know, some kind of conspiracy going on or some kind of other anomaly. It it does. It, I mean, I, I I cannot see how you don't how you avoid. Um, packing the two together. But then, as you say, coincidence is uh, an inadequate word, and uh, any other word that comes up is uh, one that I guess we don't want to use right now, like conspiracy. So let's do this. Your book opens with this quote. Out of the preface, our current president is leading us down the path of socialism, a form of government that controls everything, not just our health care. With the popularity that Bernie Sanders seems to be enjoying right now, especially among the younger generation, socialism doesn't seem to have the same connotation it had when I was young. So in your view, what's bad about this, or is it bad at all? Well, um, you know, very simply, I'm a free market person. You know, I think that uh, people uh, can and should and have for centuries uh, in this country, you know, stood on their own two feet and been responsible for their actions and have the uh, growing opportunity that the country afforded, uh, certainly uh, throughout the 19th and, and much of the 20th century. To the degree one relies on government to solve all their problems, uh, we become slaves, Elvin. We become uh, dependent on somebody else uh to be responsible for our lives, and I don't think that's a that, I don't think that's a, a a very survival approach to life. Amen. I couldn't agree more. And in fact, uh, in my own book, I talk about an agenda that was uh, publicly exposed back in the fifties. One of the three parts of this agenda was to create debt, uh, a debt burden society. Um, such that, you know, once enslaved to debt, we lost our power to do anything about whatever went on in government. And we see a lot of that today. It was explained to me this way once. Uh, a banker friend of mine said, you know, Eldon, if I come to your door and I tell you I like your home and I'm just going to take it, I want to live here, you're going to resist. But if I come to your home with a piece of paper and I say, you know, I'm sorry you didn't make your payments. You're going to have to leave. I'm evicting you. You put your head down in shame and walk away. Aren't we being, in in fact, in your opinion, indoctrinated in a sort of, you know, the government will take care of everything for us and the solution is consumption and, uh, you know, as long as... Uh, 
you can't obtain whatever you need on your own. We'll take care of it for you. Doesn't that place us in a situation where, for all intent and purposes, we do become the slaves you're talking about? Well, there's no question about it. The um, And I think I mentioned it in the book. I'm not sure exactly where, maybe in the introduction or later on. But um, the, the, the primary focus of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, these two international financial institutions that were created right after the Second World War, their product is embedded nations. You know, they have uh, all this PR that they're uh, uh, there to help people. What they produce in life is debt, indebted nations. Um, take a springboard from that, from an international uh, perspective, and uh, bring it back home to the United States and a uh, you know issue that's been getting a lot of attention here over the last, I don't know, year or so, has been the dramatic uh, increase in student debt. I, you know, when you and I were going to school, um, you know, there may have been a little of that, uh, but I've forgotten what the figure is. It's trillions and trillions of dollars. So these kids... Uh, uh, you know, graduate, uh, the, yep. the student loan program makes it very, very easy, and they graduate with thirty, forty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 worth of debt, and, you know, they, they put their uh, uh, shoes on a step to a career, dragging a massive amount of debt behind them. In addition to that, the credit card companies now make these cards available for kids. So uh, this is a primary factor in... Uh, oppression of a society. Um, it is uh, true for the public, and it's true for the government, right? $19.5 trillion in debt today. Uh, uh, the interest on the debt, even with low interest rates, is the third biggest item on the on the federal budget. So uh, without question, I would agree with your point. This is a primary focus of those that would want to make slaves out of, uh, you know, this uh, the people of this country. Your, your book does, I think, a great job at, uh, at, at pointing that out very precisely and actually, you know, going further. One of the things that I don't think most people get, and, and as I shared it with my wife, it was a, an eye-opener for her, was that when we put money in the bank, uh, we become a creditor of the bank, an unsecured creditor of the bank. And so, for all intent and purposes, it's really not our money anymore. It belongs to the bank. Flesh that out for us. Well, it's a stunning piece of information that most people, understandably, uh, have a hard time grasping because it's, uh, you know, the funds are theirs that they earned. Uh, but in fact, uh, when you deposit money in the bank, uh, legally and technically, uh, the money belongs to the bank. You are a creditor as if you laid the carpet in the lobby. They owe it to you, yes, but you're a creditor. The money belongs to the bank. And this is um, this and the, the bail-in program that you mentioned there at the top of the hour uh, is a designed program. Um, and this all, and if you, you know, you're a third of the way through the book, you, you, you are aware that this is all planned and programmed out of Basel, Switzerland, by a bank that most people have never heard of, called the Bank for International Settlement. Um, this bank, uh, formerly a, a Nazi bank, uh, is the central banker's central bank. So the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of Italy, uh, the European Central Bank, they are all members of this bank which, interestingly, uh, is in Switzerland, but Swiss law doesn't affect it. Uh, its employees its uh, uh, employees are immune from prosecution. They have their own military or police force on the property. It is above the law, Eldon. Um, and it is that entity, the Bank for International Settlement, that dictates to the central banks of the world, and the central banks, for your listeners that, that don't have their nose into that world, uh, that those are the banks in a country that uh, create the currency, that control interest rates, and basically determine if the economy is going to be inflation, deflation, or what have you. Uh, because of the dramatic increase in what are called derivatives, uh, a term that 
folks uh, heard going back to the last financial crisis. A derivative is simply uh, a security that derives or is supposed to derive its value from something else. John, I, I'm going to have to ask you, so I don't want to cut off in the break. I'm going to ask you to hold it right yeah, there. Yeah, sure. Uh, because you're going to you're about to pull the rug out on everybody, and I want them to <laughs> thoroughly understand that. Because when we talk about debt, if you understand that it's not your money, you'll quickly understand that that ties in to creating more debt. We're speaking with Mr. John Truman Wolf about his research and book, The Coming Financial Crisis. I can't recommend this book too highly. Go get it. To learn more about our guest and his work, visit his website at thehardtruthmag.com or at crisisbydesign.net or at his personal site, johntrumanwolf.com. Okay, we have a video for you today featuring our guest discussing the global and political issues involved in the coming financial crisis. So join Ravinder in the chat room. If you're listening on the dial, remember you can check the chat room out later when you're in front of your computer by going to Progressive Provocative, I'm sorry, ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. A silent battle has been raging for the territory of your mind. Like a virulent virus, the effects are spreading. In Gotcha, Eldon Taylor explores the 24-7 bombardment of information designed to manage your thinking. He demonstrates how new sound bites are championed into personal awareness, becoming memes of the culture. And this results in framing and reframing classical positions, causing adjustments to personal values and history itself. Your every decision process is being managed and manipulated. Gotcha exposes the arrival of the Orwellian age in full-blown technicolor. In laying bare the current uses of the many sophisticated techniques, Eldon reveals what it is we need to do in order to avoid allowing others to puppet our thoughts. For details, go to eldentaylor.com backslash gotcha. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Alvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with John Truman Wolf about his research and book, The Coming Financial Crisis. Now, we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some genuine significance to them. I have a hobby, and it's music psychology right now, and that's a brand new field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including investigations of human aptitude, skill, intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. Indeed, music has been shown to change the way you think. So I get this great opportunity to ask some of the brightest people on the planet what their favorite single piece of music is, and you'd be surprised at some of the self-disclosure. All right, we just played some of Lying Eyes by the Eagles. So please tell us, why is this music important to you, John, and how does it instruct us about who you are? <laughs> that's, that's that's an interesting uh, evaluation. Uh, you, you know, I don't. I'm not sure there's too much significance in it, uh, Eldon, other than the fact that I was a big fan of Glenn, uh, Glenn Fry's, um, and uh, you know, I love their music. I love the Eagles' mu- music, and and um, you know, those of us that did, which is you know, damn near everybody, we, you know, mourned uh, Glenn Fry's uh, loss. I just, I, you know, it's a it's a great town, it's a, a great song. It's a very interesting story. Uh, that they tell in the lyrics of that song, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's just well. You know, I'm gonna, I, I want to talk to you about your book, so I'm going to give you a pass on this one. But those right, lyrics, those lyrics have got to be tied in there more. So, <laughs> before the break, we were about to, you were about to explain derivatives and how that wraps around to this bail-in and the ins or the unsecured nature of the creditor who is the depositor, the you and me who put our money into the bank, everybody out there that thinks, well, I've got a little bit of cushion just in case there's a rainy day. Uh, really, you know, perhaps we don't have that cushion. Perhaps our deposit is indeed 
just another form of debt. Explain that to us, please. Well, I, I did get uh, off on a, when you asked the question, I kind of backed up to the source of the problem, which is this bank in Basel, Switzerland, as I said before the break, the Bank for International right. Settlements. And what has occurred, uh, Eldon, and uh, please, listeners, uh, it's important. I mean, I wrote the book. I, you know, I love selling books, but I wrote it primarily to inform people, and this is a critical uh, reason why uh, it was just published, um, and that's this. Uh, uh, the banking world has now uh, is now pregnant with 1.4 quadrillion quadrillion 15 zeros of derivatives. Derivatives um, are uh, securities that quote derive their value from something else. If you had a contract for the delivery of gold, the contract is the derivative. It's because it's not the gold. Um, but derivatives like that are a, a fraction, a very small fraction of the actual derivatives. Most of the derivatives are bets between banks called interest rate swaps. It's just a term. But, uh, you know, B of A says, uh, you know, Greece, the interest rate on Greece bonds is going up. Deutsche Bank says they're going down. And so they bet. And that bet becomes a security. And then people bet on their bets, and then people bet on those bets, and others bet on those bets, and there is this skyrocketing pyramid of over a quadrillion dollars worth of this, these Vegas casino-like bets. Now, the banks are full of these things, and sooner or later, this bubble will break. When it breaks, and I throw in a quick footnote here that U.S. banks have $228 trillion, with a T, dollars worth of these derivatives. When it breaks, uh, there will be a banking crisis. To me, it's not if, it's when. And new legislation uh, that this administration put together called Dodd-Frank and some other legislation basically sets things up such that when a bank starts to fail, this new policy originated by this bank in Switzerland says the, those with the derivatives are protected. What isn't protected are the deposits. And the deposits are, as we mentioned before the break, unsecured creditors. The money belongs to the bank, not to, not to you and me. So uh, the bank starts to fail. Though the derivatives holders take all the, you know, take the assets. Those with um, deposits, you know, take what crumbs may be left. But this new plan enables or allows the bank to take depositors' money and convert it to bank stock. Uh, this isn't conspiracy theory stuff. This is real. It was implemented formally in Europe on January 1st of this year. Uh, yesterday, Canada implemented bail-in policy, and the FDIC has issued a memo on how bail-ins will occur here. Now, let me repeat it really quickly. A failing bank will uh, protect the derivatives, but will make itself solvent by taking depositors' money. The question becomes, well... I've got FDIC insurance. They'll protect me. Maybe. Maybe. Because the white paper that the FDIC issued on this doesn't mention insurance. It doesn't say yes. It doesn't say no. In addition to that, the FDIC insurance fund is $67 billion. There's $9 trillion in deposits. Yeah. So this is a crisis that's coming, and that's a long-winded answer to your question, Elvin. No, that's not the long-winded answer. That's actually, you packed that one in really tight. Uh, the the answer is quite a bit more complicated than just that. So The Wizard Behind the Curtain, which is the subtitle to your book, is this bank in Switzerland? Yes, sir. So, so uh, you know, someone has to say, and I think there's two parts to I I want to flesh out here if we can. The first one is, you know, the average person might think, well, but, you know, these banks, they don't want to fail. They don't want to go the route of Lehman Brothers. So um, why would they, you know, participate in this? And, and that average person doesn't realize that they actually make money in this process. I'd like you to pa unpack that for us. And then the second aspect of this is um, 
what what on earth is the overall agenda of this uh you call it mafia financial mafia what 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 is it they intend to gain by this well let, let me take the 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 first part of the question please um, yeah and 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 that is that the the banks actually don't have a choice they are controlled by uh the central banks of their country and uh, this is policy this isn't uh, something about which they have a choice uh, number one, uh, you know, and how does the bank benefit? Uh, they benefit because they're sitting with trillions of dollars in derivatives, and they get to uh, keep their derivatives, and they get to keep those assets. And uh, because they have made, or despite the fact that they have made poor investment decisions, and people, you know, wake up and realize that there's nothing but, you know, hot air in these uh, bets, um Nevertheless, the bank then comes and take, takes the depositor's money. Um, so, so the that's bank how gets benefit. richer, technically. Just, I'm just sorry, like, they get... So the bank gets richer, technically, just they, like yes, many of those banks from the so-called bailout, right? That, that, that's exactly right. That's what Dodd, the Dodd-Frank bill was supposed to do. Uh, but, in fact, it opened the door to protect these banks with the derivatives, and they do benefit from it. And... If they've had a problem or made, uh, to repeat, made bad investment decisions, uh, they cover that by taking your and my money. Right. Um, and the second so, part of the question was, oh, what's the agenda? Yeah. Um, what, what is the overall agenda? I mean, why would, you know, is it just about gather up the money? Yeah, they want to save the big banks. They want to save. It's very clear that this derivatives market is going to go under. So the Bank for International Settlements protects uh, their clients, which are the big banks, uh, by going. You know, if the, you know when the, when this market collapses, just go, you know, just go make yourself whole from the depositors. So it's it's purely a protection mechanism. Um, and for you know, for the listeners that don't know, for instance, the U.S. Fed is owned by the New York banks. It's, it's not a government institution. It's owned by the major New York City bank. That's who are the stockholders of the Federal Reserve Bank, not not the government, not the taxpayer. Um, you know, Janet Yellen's boss, Bernanke's boss, Greenspan's boss, were the major New York banks. You know, do you ever reduce this to players? Because when you look at, you know, the banks, there are some families that control the banking business, just like there are a few uh, conglomerates that control 90% of the media in America. So have you reduced it to uh, that level, or do we just stay with, uh, you know, this Basel Bank in Switzerland? Well, there's a whole chapter in the book on Goldman Sachs, and uh, uh, there are also comments in there on uh, Citibank. Um, look, you, you mentioned in the introduction, of, you know, that I that I flew to China. The the Rothschild Rockefeller banking cartel got their fangs into Western Europe around the turn of the last century. Um, you know, Western Europe and the United States are bankrupt. We're bankrupt. They didn't get their fangs into Beijing. Beijing's got $3.2 trillion in reserves. Um, so they're, you know, they're trying currently. But um, this is, you know, just kind of back up from it and look at it globally, uh, where these families, and speaking of families, uh, the, the, the Rothschilds or the Rockefellers are very involved in the formation of the Federal Reserve Bank, um, you know, after the turn of the last century. Um, those are families that have been instrumental uh, in this, uh, you know, mafia, this monopoly uh, to control people uh, and to control economies. Um, and Goldman Sachs, in, in recent decades, has been a player as well, as I as I detail in the book. Right. And in fact, again, I'm going to recommend this book. Everybody needs to read this, especially when you're looking at some of the so-called heroes, the Paulson and the Geithner and, and whatnot that we hear about who save our economy. Uh, when you see where they play and how instrumental they have been in uh, orchestrating all of this uh, and where their loyalties really lie, there's, uh, there's a big curtain that is pulled back. Isn't that right, sir? 
That's exactly right. Um, I, and I do get into Hank Paulson. I mean, you know, Paulson was the CEO of Goldman Sachs before George Bush called him to Washington to be the Treasury sec- Secretary right before the last financial crisis. Uh, and it was Paulson that uh, rammed the, uh, you know, the bailout through Congress with all kinds of horror stories. Uh, and where did that money go? A, ch- a big chunk of it just went to repay the Wall Street banks that had lost money. Um, uh, Tim Geithner was part of that plan, which you can, uh, the, the former president of the New York Fed and then the U.S. Uh, Treasury Secretary uh, was, was part of that. Uh, in addition, uh, one of the Goldman execs, that left Goldman Sachs the same time Hank Paulson did, a guy named Mario Draghi, D-R-A-G-H-I. Draghi went to become the chairman of the Italian Central Bank. Then he joined the BIS. Um, He actually joined um, an entity called the Financial Stability Board, which is essentially part of the BIS. And now he is the chairman of the uh, European Central Bank, like the Fed of Europe. So He's a planetary bad guy. Uh, Draghi is. Uh, Paulson has basically wrote a book and stepped off the stage. Uh, but Draghi is very, very instrumental uh, in it currently um, and is trying to, uh, you know, pour. It, he's doing quantitative easing in Europe like uh, Bernanke did here. A massive, massive failure. Um, but he's involved in that now. So those are some of the names uh, uh, that are involved. Okay, now step aside from the players for a moment. A lot of conversation about, you know, the Fed printing money, fractional reserve, da 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 da, and the amount of M1 that's in our system. Um, and what would happen if the dollar uh, suddenly was not the international currency? The impact it would have on this country. Uh, and, and if I understood your book correctly, the scenario that's being designed is such that they'll be able to implement a lot of things by bringing about this crisis, and one of those is to remove the dollar as a standard of currency. True or false? Yes, absolutely absolutely true. Uh, Part of the purpose of the global financial crisis, the last one, was to remove the dollar as the stable point in international finance um, and as the re- world reserve currency and replace it with something else. That is going on as we speak. Well, you know, most people aren't aware of it. Uh, deals are now being made between Russia and China or uh, the so-called BRIC nations, which is uh, Brazil, Russia, Ind- India, China, and South Africa. Uh, they're making uh, trade deals in their own currencies. This would have been, their own currencies. This would have been unheard of, Eldon, um, a few years ago, everything right. would have had to go through the dollar from one currency to the dollar to another currency. The dollar is being bypassed now. Um, uh, reserve currency basically means, for your listeners, that's the currency that central banks keep to you know, buy oil or other things. Right. The dollar is slowly being replaced as the world reserve currency uh, first by the yuan, the Chinese currency, uh, also called the renminbi, RMB. Uh, that currency has two names, yuan and uh, renminbi. Uh, but also by the SDR, which stands for Special Drawing Rights, which is the currency of the International Monetary Fund. So that's happening now, right now. Um, it's, it's slow. You know, it's the frog in the beaker kind of thing where the, the temperature just slowly gets turned up. But that's occurring as we speak. What happens in your view to our economy? Just take that one scenario. We're no longer pegging oil, say, at, uh, at a dollar. What happens? Well, the dollar becomes less valuable. Um, uh, it becomes much less valuable. And uh When you stop and take a look at it, the amount of foreign products that we buy here is staggering. Cars will be more expensive. The electronics will be more expensive. Um, uh, You know, various things that are imported now from South America or Mexico or um, from China. Uh, The cost of goods will go up. The value of the dollar will go down. The amount of interest on the debt will go up because people will shun 
uh, government debt. Um, listen, when I went to Beijing, that was the problem they had, right? They're sitting with $3.2 trillion in reserves, and a, tr- a trillion of that uh, was in U.S. US debt. Yeah. So the government is spending like a drunken sailor. The value of the dollar was going down. That means their reserves are going down. They didn't know what to do. They're focused on gold over there. That's their focus. We should go to that. But before we go to your advice, and I think that's a critical part of this show, uh, before we go to that, um, you know, we, we're in an election cycle. And, and every, you know, every time we go into an election cycle, it seems like the gimmies go up more and more. And, and people want more and more. Um, isn't that contributing to the entire mess that you're talking about? I mean, it's as though we have an appetite and, and it's being fed by this monster. If I, if I got that right? Yes, you're absolutely right. And look, look, Wall Street owns Washington. They own it. They don't, if folks can actually grasp this, that this bank, this, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, which is owned by the New York banks, uh, they prosper when we go in debt. So if right. you look at the, if you look at the graph on the national debt, it skyrockets. That's how they prosper. Um, and you can see when, what happens when Congress, uh, you know, uh, decides or some in Congress uh, start talking about balancing the budget or cutting uh, the budget back. It's insane the way the government does finance. They do yeah. they do finance backwards. The, the, okay, the we only have a couple of minutes, and I want right. to make sure that we get this in here. Your advice, what do you do? You, you've got money in the bank. Uh, what do you do? Uh, step one, if you're in a large money center bank like B of A, uh, Citibank, uh, Chase, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, my advice is to move your accounts to a smaller independent bank or a credit union, a regional bank or a credit union. Those big banks uh, are full of derivatives. That's step number one. Step number two: take some actual cash out of the bank, put it in a safe at home. If you don't have a safe, buy one. Get some cash out of the bank. Uh, number three: um, precious metals. Uh, gold and silver. I'm more of a silver fan than I am a gold fan, but uh, I would strongly encourage people to have some precious metals because uh, if this bubble breaks and uh, the economy goes to hell in a handbasket, uh, having some precious metals will be uh, very beneficial. Unless so, we have another Roosevelt era. But go yeah. on, I don't mean to interrupt. That's all right. Anyway, those are the you know four quick steps. Uh, get out of the big banks, cash, uh, precious metals, and, and, and stay liquid. We're in a deflationary environment. In the in deflationary environment, cash is king. Okay, so don't take your money and pay off your debt. Retain your cash and keep your debt? But, well, uh, it, it would depend on the... the, the Say a mortgage. Cert- Say cert- mortgages, you know, not credit card. Yeah, I... I my, yeah. My focus would be on building cash reserves. Now, to the degree that, you know, you can pay off debt, I would do so. But the more important thing is is to build your cash reserve. Excellent. Uh, you offer um, consulting services. And uh, so in the next 30 seconds, if you will, tell everybody how they can reach out to you, learn more about you, get in touch with you, get your advice. Um, sure. They can... Um, uh, they can reach me at my email address, which is bruce at brucewiseman.net, which is my name. I write under the name, as you mentioned, John Truman Wolf, bruce at brucewiseman.net. Um, they can, and in terms of the book, uh, you know, go to Amazon, uh, John Truman Wolf, The Coming Financial Crisis. Um, and I do do some consulting um, to, a, to, you know, a handful of people. I'm, I'm busy promoting the book, but uh, happy to hear from folks. Okay. The book again, The Coming Financial Crisis, A Look Behind the Wizard's Curtain. I cannot recommend this too highly. Go to Amazon, get the book. If you have any money and you care about, you know, your future, do it today. I want to thank you, John, uh, for your willingness to share everything with us and for your work. 
We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you out there for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show and will join us again next week. Until then, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com. <laughs>